preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. I have such chapped lips tonight. Um, and also, the other thing that I have tonight is uh, I have this effect on, on electricity. And I decided I'm going to admit it today. Like, I have to wear a wind-up. This is my mother-in-law's mother's watch that she got for, for 50 years of service at uh, the GM plant making pies. And it, <laughs> it seems to be the only watch I can wear without stopping. Um, so, like, I put on, you know, the battery watches. They stop. And the reason, usually only before I perform, you know. Um, so, uh, so, so then I, here, I cannot get this to work, all right? So I'm bringing that up because I know this is a place of lectures and smart people. So I'm totally interested now in being tested for my electrical current that I give out. Um, so if anyone has any pacemakers, I just want to let you know. <laughs> I'm alive tonight. All right, I'd like to talk about so many things tonight. I've got so much on my mind, and I've got about three more lectures I want to do here. I definitely want to do a lecture a lot talking about, um, about uh, alternative culture in, in America and New York and how it's kind of dying with the arts here in the city. I want to do that, too. But before I, I'm going to talk a little bit about that, too. But um, I'm here for my book, Living It Up, <laughs> and I want to start talking about how I came to this idea with this book. I, I don't know, I had my daughter, and I, that means she came out of my legs, and I, I gave birth to her, and then some things did change. I mean, everyone always says, oh, your life is going to change. Well, it's, it does. You know, I always know it isn't, but it does. So I'm in the grocery store, and I, I am just so sick of being inundated with the magazines, the women's magazines telling me to be a better mother, a better daughter, a better sister, a hundred recipes for meatloaf, you know, to be a better, you know, sexual, orgasmic something, and all of the holidays coming up, and all the things, and I do not see anything. And I have checked out GQ, and Esquire, and Time, um, which tells the man how to be a better husband, father, brother, citizen of the world. Could you imagine, like, if we were to go in the grocery store and there would be like 12 magazines up there? Men's World, how to crochet your underwear while you're waiting for the bus. You know, then there could be another one. It's a guy thing. How to make uh, uh, your, a brassiere for your, for your wife with sequins and um, saving all the gum wrappers. And you could make these incredible homemade jewelry for her and she'll love you forever. Um, no, uh, no, that, see, that's the liberation. That's what I'm waiting for. So I'm looking at that, and I was just thinking, you know, and I was also, all these things are coming. You know how it's like, you know, they talk about the collective unconscious. Well, this was happening in my brain. All the things are going on. Um, and, okay, Marsha Clark. <laughs> and I'm going, you know, you're sitting back on, in the bed. I'm watching and watching. Okay, Marsha, what you need, you need to get your face on the cover of McCall's. That's, because I saw, I just bought McCall's last week, because they had Jane Seymour on the cover, and I wanted to know, excuse my language in this way, because it's not right, but, okay, excuse my language, it's a, not right, okay, it's a little sexist, how she, you know, popped out two children at 44, and she looked the way she did, okay, and I wanted to find out, of course they didn't tell me. They didn't tell me that. She lived in this thousand-year-old estate and how she made, she always serves tamari pumpkin seeds on, you know, Christmas Eve or whatever. I'm going, where is it? Where is it? You know, okay. <laughs> they should have had, you know, Marsha, if she was on the cover, that's what they wanted, to be talking about her, 
you know, her domestic stuff. So let me first start out how my book starts out here. Dear friends, I know and fully understand how guilty we feel that we aren't making something out of nothing constantly in our hectic lives. For instance, you know how hard it must have been for Marsha Clark to have made dinner while in court every day. Well, while everyone was looking at her skirt length, I was looking at the court table and I thought, there has got to be room for a crock pot. Here is my recipe for court crock pot stew. Go to Automat in court and buy everything for $10 and quarters, one roll. Peanut butter on cheese crackers, tortilla chips, microwave beefaroni, popcorn, and pretzels. Place in crock pot filled with water from the drinking fountain and four chicken bouillon cubes. Now most people carry emergency provisions in their car. Well, I don't go anywhere without my trusty Teflon convertible crock pot. What does it convert to, you ask? Well, you can do several small loads of wash, last night's dishes, and most importantly, crock pot stew. All while making opening remarks, closing statements, examinations, etc. Now, I also have, at all times, a hundred foot bright orange utility extension cord for those hard to reach, hard to get to down the hall behind the jury, judge, or opposing lawyers' outlets. If you thought moving the sofa every time you vacuum is hard, just imagine moving an entire jury in alternates. I carry a good long extension cord to plug in the crock pot. After lunch, take half-eaten sandwiches, celery, carrots from leftover lunches, french fries, stick and stew. And if anyone objects to the crock pot, say, you don't want me to make dinner for my kids? That'll shut them up. Drive home in car with crock pot and lap. Make sure you use a pillow or it'll just get all over your notes and papers. Ladle stew and bowls with lots of Parmesan cheese. Kids will love it. Here in Living It Up, I invite you to join me in humorous adventures and hyperdomesticity. So then the next one, I'll have the first slide, please is is you know is Martha I was to say is Martha Stewart oh my god this that actually I was watching you know Martha Stewart and that is yes there was some influence there okay just a little bit and what happened is I was watching Martha Stewart and she was making and I was watching her show it's like Sunday morning and they have a, uh, she says, oh, the geranium pots are out, okay? And you're, let's plant the geraniums in a terracotta planter. Okay, the terracotta planter is not good enough, okay? We've got to get a special terracotta planter that's one and a half inch lip instead of just one inch. Okay, all right, fine, fine. Seven ninety nine instead of a dollar twenty nine. All right, fine. They're measuring out there. They're measuring the lip of the terracotta planter. <gasps> Um, <laughs> oh boy, I don't know, I just, the whole thing is so hysterical. So then, you know, I'm watching it, and then all of a sudden, paint the geranium planter. It's Sunday morning, I finally have a half hour off, I've been working my butt off, 6.30, my husband goes to law school at Cardozo, I'm up at 5, I'm not going till about 10 every more, every night, you know? Okay, it's Sunday morning. Get the geranium plants out and paint the planter. Okay, fine. I'm a visual artist. I've got paint around. No! You've got to make your own paint. <laughs> That's my problem. That's why. That's why I'm not at you know at the modern or the I'm not making my own paint. All right. So then if we're looking all the stuff is okay. Hillary, what's Hillary? Let's let's just segue a little bit. What's Hillary's problem? So Hillary's problem is because she doesn't have a woman's problem. She's got a man's problem. Money. That's so what the other thing is. See, everyone wants Hillary really 
See, that's why they have Martha Stewart as the new, she is really our first lady. Martha, that's why everyone got into it. She has the hair cut. That's really the way that Hillary is supposed to look. And she can decorate the White House. They bring her in. And I can just hear the people, you know, her advisors, just going, you know, going through, uh, you know, Hillary. Hillary, why couldn't you um, just go and forget about your husband's infidelities like Jackie Kennedy and redecorate the White House? Just give me one room blue. Just give me one and then put it on TV. Get it on TV with Charlie Rose or someone 60 minutes and take us and redecorate the damn place. Make it paisley, give us something. Or then they'll go to Lady Bird Johnson. Come on, you got pick something up, Hillary. Get us a, uh, uh, get us a, uh, uh, you know, clean up the highways, do something. Or, you know, uh, for Reagan, be mean to your kids. Get mean. Get mean, or get an, or be like, uh, whatever, Ford, Mrs. Ford. You know what you need? You need to get one of your ovaries removed, a breast. That's what you need. You need something removed. If she had one of her female organs, excuse me, removed, she would be loved. She would be constantly on the covers of Good Housekeeping, her horror story. It would be there. Okay. She needs a constant, let's look at the makeover now that they're in, is that I really suggest the whole trip is to be more yourself. So I suggest for her, for Hillary is, let her hair go and part in the middle and henna orange. I would love it. Lots of braids and then unbraid for a fuller look. And you know, this could actually, an uh, iron hair for the Peggy Lipton look, that's a look I'd like for her. Granny glasses, oh, I love it. And then no bra. I think it's about time. Just, you know, that would be a statement. That would be a statement. I'm, you know, I've got, I've got his name, but I, I'm, I'm not wearing a bra. Or wear a leotard that gets the nipple look. Have Chelsea make you daisy necklaces, knapsack, bell sleeves, and go barefoot in the White House. I think it'd be great. Okay, give me the next, uh, I'd like the next slide, please. Okay, for Bill. I think I did a good drawing for Bill. You know, they're not themselves. I love them. Yes, yes, I did. Uh, no, I didn't vote for him that day. I was sick. I guess I can't see him. I was sick. I'm sorry. I'm not limping along. I, I, said, I, can't, I'm, I just can't do it. Um, anyway, <laughs> anyway, I would love to see his hair just out there. Grow your hair, Bill. Bill and your, let, let your hair do what it finally wants to do. Um, the patchouli oil, I definitely think for raising money for, I think they should have a scent called white water. It would be great. A scent called, I think it should be an after cologne splash called white water. And I think it should definitely be patchouli based. It would be so great. Sell it at the souvenir store at the White House. All right, then I think the next thing is he's got to get a tattoo, which I didn't put on there. I really think it'd be, I, I'd love to see Bill with a tattoo. In fact, he probably has one, we don't know. Short sleeve Nehru jacket worn off open in acid print paisley, but it's way too tight. I think it'd be great to have it too tight with a deadhead t-shirt underneath it. And you know, it's like, you know, sometimes like some of those guys that wear the deadhead t-shirts and they get holy. Oh, I love that, with like some of the gray hairs coming out. Big pockets for bongs. Get Colin Powell's old army pants if, if they fit, and if not, guess you need Schwarzkopf's. You know, army boots, and I think the best shoes are Mexican tire sandals, you know, for the NAFTA agreement would be really good. Okay, now, you know, it is November, and, um, okay, next slide, please, is, after like makeovers too, is that, okay, I, I, yeah, you should, with people, they don't even make it to my living room when I've got, I've got this in my uh, hallway. And um, I was plastering my hallway, I'm looking for some good ideas, and I look down at the Times and I see Clinton jogging, and I go, that is it. And so I've made these wonderful uh, patterns, these wonderful strokes that um, you know that you that I have in my uh, in my hallway. Um, 
Now, I'll just read, I'll read it on a look. Okay. Uh, November also means election time, so what better time to make an addition to my presidential library? or hallway. My grand entrance hallway is plastered with towel strokes inspired by presidents. For example, a swooping ski jump nose stroke for Nixon, peanut shaped strokes for Jimmy Carton, and interpreting the rounded bottom of Rubenesque Bill Clinton. I'd like to share with you how I came to the creation of my presidential hallway. Now, like I said, I began by covering the floor with the last few issues of the Sunday New York Times, and I have the paper delivered, and I actually never seem to have time to read it, but it looks great sitting out in front of my house all morning every Sunday. Anyway, it's large pages. It makes the best floor covering for my craft projects. I started to plaster, but I just could, couldn't seem to get the strokes the way I wanted them with my trowel. I realized that I lacked inspiration. I hung my head in dejection and was staring down at the paper-covered floor when it hit me. There was President Clinton on the front page of the Times in his jogging shorts, that quivering derriere. He would be my inspiration much like the classical painters had their models. And I do have a lovely result. My textured walls looks fabulous, and I have Bill Clinton's tush to thank for it. Um, the other things, too, that I think is good to do is, is you can also write words in plaster to describe the president. Like I have chosen some of the sayings in there, adult child of an alcoholic or people pleaser. And the sentence is, that it's it's okay, I also have written down on the bottom by the radiator, it's okay to tell the world that you are embarrassed by your brother. Um, next slide, please. All right, now Thanksgiving is coming, and I know that it is really a very frustrating situation, okay, because our family is coming, and there's football. I grew up in a family with four brothers. My mother with, you know, Gourmet Magazine, she has them all. Um, we have them all. I get all the, all the magazines, looking for all the different turkey recipes, everything. And you know that they will just be eating and uh, just be sitting in front of the tube. You know, like you'll say, oh, dinner is served. And the next thing they'll say, oh, you know, I'm just all filled up on Doritos and onion dip. Oh, uh, dinner is served. Oh, just wait a minute. Let me just let the football game, you know, go. So what I have done is I have um, a special thing called I call a turkey brew. And to start, everyone should own a 50-pound blender at least. Now, they are hard to find, but I'm going to have them included in my Kitchen Blender of the Month Club soon. Now, I start with a 20-pound tom turkey cooked and stuffed from my book, Thanksgiving, Our Yearly Pilgrimage, in an encyclopedia edition. Put the turkey in the bottom of the blender, giblets, bones, skins, and all. Now, that's cooked. Cook the whole dinner in advance in August, and then what you do is you defrost the entire dinner the day before. Just take the whole thing out. So you've made your entire dinner. Then what you do is you put the turkey in, put it on the bottom, and first what I like to do is I just blend, go puree everything through the dial about three or four or five times. Tip the stuffing, make sure, you know, I, I you know, make sure that the neck and everything is ground up good. Um, then what I do is I add five pounds of potatoes. Now, there's no need to mash those babies. Just get them in. Um, and that's what I always say to myself, aren't blenders great? They are incredible. Um, now, you're going to love this the more that you hear about this recipe. You're going to love this. Um, and it's not, too, it's not too late either. Next, add the butter, parsley, and sour cream, and then five pounds of the baked sweet potatoes with plenty of butter. I always bake mine, though, so I don't, you know, just put them in raw. I like to put in my rolls next. Now, don't use store-bought rolls, for the dough gets too patsy or pasty, and the blender, bl a blender doesn't mix well. Follow this with the vegetables, peas with pearl onions, broccoli au gratin, and French-cut frozen beans with a can of mushroom soup. You do not have to cook that together. Just put in the frozen beans, okay? And then just put in the can of mushroom soup and do not dilute it. Don't put in an extra cup of water or anything. Okay, you thought I forgot the appetizer. No, no, no. Well, I didn't. In goes the carrot and celery sticks, olives without the pits, bread and butter pickles. And watch out for the pickle juice or else the whole thing can sour. Now, what's Thanksgiving without turkey and what's turkey without the cranberry sauce? Pretty lousy. So what you want to make sure is you get the cranberry sauce, but that I don't freeze. I put that in. Then I get, of course, I get all of the pie. 
pies, as you see, I put three pies in, just take them out, put them in, you know, chalk, uh, chocolate doesn't work too good. It's overpowering. And pumpkin, I don't know. So if you can just figure some apple, it goes very well. Put whipped cream over it, then put the seconds in right over that, and then take a bottle of hot peppered vodka over the top, whole bottle, and then just blend the, excuse my language, the shit out of it. Just blend it, and then, um, okay, I know what you're all saying. You're saying, my family will not drink or eat a cold meal for Thanksgiving. I know that's what I thought myself. I thought, I'm going to have to throw this whole thing away. No, I just microwaved it for 30 seconds, put it in. Like, you know, I went over, I got some of those like little Thanksgiving cups, put that in, put two in so it doesn't burn their fingers, and just like sit, let them sit at the couch, pass it out. And, you know, I just put mine on a rocks glass over some ice, sprig of mint, and I'm happy. A little sage if you want it more Thanksgiving. Okay, next, uh, no fights, nothing. Okay, um... You know, the holidays are coming, and I just, one thing is, is I've uh, carved icicles from glued sugar cubes to make, that's what I'm working on for my holiday village, and also I have crocheted a snowflake toilet seat cover from the dental floss. Um, there is maybe still, I don't know if there's time for that yet to do, but you could get started for next year, but maybe you could get it. All right, so I know some of you are thinking, you know, toilets. That, let, let's get to the next slide, please. Everyone is thinking, I went, I've got to do something with this guest bathroom, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you, it just, it wasn't working, the ideas. I had to get it some punch. I, I, see, this year, I'm totally redecorating my downstairs bathroom with the infinite skaters, Nancy Kerrigan and Tanya Harding as a the theme. Now, I've totally redecorated my down, you know, I've totally did it. Now, I must admit, I was looking for an excuse to use these two charming ladies. And they have really, as you can see, been quite an inspiration. In fact, I think that they could do an entire line at Kmart. I mean, toilet seats are something aren't used. I mean, there's so much there. I mean, Kathy Lee Gifford hasn't gotten into it. There's really a... Okay, now, first, what I've also done besides here, I've hung skates from the ceiling, and I focus little mini halogen spotlights on the skates. And they make wonderful shadows. I love that. And they're also, you know, a nightlight. You've got to have a nightlight in a bathroom, whether you use it or not. Okay, now, I've hand-painted. Let's get right to the toilets. What I've done here is I've hand-painted onto the toilet lid the scene of Nancy's knee legs being clubbed and that I do provide the stencils in the back of the book um, when you open up the lid I have and I fact I just saw it I was watching a skating program they're showing it I have Tanya with her lace broken and she is complaining to the judges um, and then I have and, and men get to see that more because they pee Although it depends if they put the lid up or not. Okay, Skating Tanya. Now, just around here, I have Skating Tanya and Skating Nancy. And that is where the inspiration came. I'm looking at the seat, the round circle. What goes round and round and round? And skaters. And I was made. I, was, I had a creative, functional idea. And white like the ice rink, I didn't add anything to the base. Now, what I want to tell you is, Use enamel paint, no acrylic. Enamel wears better, I found. All right, next, next slide, please. Now, January is, you know, I'll t I don't know about you, but I, I get really tired of my friends' resolutions. Oh, I, mean, eh. I just go and I do it for them. I go in there right away. I, see, I like to start the year off with a New Year's Day resolution party. I invite one person only. I decide for the whole year who needs it the worst, and I'm going to change, and I'm going to take care of this for once and for all. I don't care if I'm never going to see me, but I'm going to take care of this problem, all right? Um, I invite one person in the house, and I psychologically rip her or him to shreds to the point out what needs to be resolved in their life. Now, they are never, I know, they're, you're never going to resolve your problem. So I'm here now, and I'm going to take care of it. 
And I just say, I am sick and tired of hearing you bitch about your job, your family, and your relationship. Then I take over their life and I make the telephone calls for her. I call her father-in-law to go to hell. I announce a divorce to a spouse. I quit a job for her. Yeah, it's tense, but it's so much fun. Now, sometimes when the personal life is awful, the living quarters are as well. So it means I have to go to their house and rearrange the furniture, clear out their closet, that's going, that shirt from high school, tear down the curtains, throw off that dog pee stained rug once and for out. It's, they're devastated, yes they are, but, um, and they'll, but they'll never be the same once I get through their closet. It it just it's ne the look on their face when I throw out you know their shirts or things they liked. Now I extend this resolution service to all of my friends if they ask me, but I select one particular friend in per right there. Now I send New Year's resolution cards to friends, families, and acquaintances. Now I'd like to show you um, and like this year you know let's let, uh, next slide please. You know, I've taken the time to make your New Year's resolution. Soak the spinach in salt water to remove sand. Here's to a prosperous year, signed resolution now. Or for example, this year, why don't you try and bring a hostess gift when you come to my house? Or, you know, don't chill the wine. Um, the red wine. Okay, uh, next. It's very simple. Very good. Next slide, please. All right, this is the particular slide that got the publishers of the book that I was originally to be published with, with Crown, that was publishing Martha Stewart. I was told when I asked, well, what in particular, see what happened, I was with Crown, and what happened is that they removed it because they felt that it was a little bit too tough on Martha Stewart. And when I asked them particularly, well, what is it? They said, this particular one, they didn't want to uh, have Martha Stewart uh, on the uh, it all felt with any hygienic products. Next slide, please. Those are supposed to be like pine needles. What it was is a pine needle underwear. And all the pine needles from Christmas trees, collect them and put them in between two uh, underwear and then wear them as like a little deodorizer or whatever. And that was the one that took them over. Okay, um, making your very own casket. Now that's something. Um, that, oh boy, that's a problem, I'll tell you. Um, you know, I've just come to realize that I can't trust anyone to correctly organize my funeral after I'm gone. Many people fear death, death, but my biggest fear is that my last appearance will be lying in an ordinary, nondescript, unmemorable casket. I want people walking away from my funeral with tears in their eyes, saying, that was the most beautiful, amazingly decorated coffin I've ever seen. Now the only way to ensure a funeral to my liking is to plan and rehearse my own funeral. Now people rehearse their weddings, take birthing classes where they practice breathing, practice baking cake till they get it just right. So every year I rehearse my funeral with me as center stage, obviously. Now, I send out invitation has become an annual event with guests even sending funeral wreaths and flowers. Now, because I decided, do you think a funeral director is going to tell me what the best looking casket is? I don't think so. <laughs> I've looked at them. The first of all, the problem is, is they're too new. They don't, they don't, they don't, they're just, they haven't been lived in. There's no style to it. Now, I, what I, I also like to make sure that I have on the, in the funeral on the, on the, on, uh, the caskets, I want to make sure that people cry. So some of the things that I've done here is I get a casket that I first start um, with distressed woods, and I'd like to, I'd like to share the plans with you. Um, what I do is I get, a, you know, get the wood, and I, I cut it out around the shape of my body, 
And um, now this, okay, I've got a rectangle here, but you can go wild with make a butterfly, caterpillar, anything you want. And then cut it out, and I like distressed wood. That's what I use. I get, I go all the way up star, state, and I try to get distressed barn wood. Um, then what I do is I get the hot glue gun, and I know many of you came here tonight just because you heard I would be talking about the hot glue gun. Um, and what I do is I get the rick rack. All right, and I put that all on the bottom, old buttons. I start saving buttons from the clothes, and I, uh, I also put blue felt in the inside, and then I take all the gourds, hydrangeas, and put that on the top, and just glue, excuse my bad, like the shit out of it. Okay, and now also too, is that to get people, I, yep, that's kids' palm prints and thumb prints on the lower right hand. That is what gets people crying. Get their hand print on the, oh, it's a guaranteed wet day over there. And I love it. Now, also what I want to tell you is remember, try to wear red when dead. The color looks good on a, a pale body. Um, so that's, you know, that's sort of the idea. You know, get all, you know, and make it wild. If you're wild, get it wild. Get like your old bed spread, anything. Just get anything on there. Just start playing around with it. Okay, next, sli next slide. Um, now, for February, what, it's a depressed month. Let's, let's tell, is there anything you can do with February? It's, it's, it's a sad month. Um, it's, nothing, you know, nothing happens in February. I'll, you know, talk about Valentine's Day. But really, what I do is when I get very depressed, I try to fill my life with lots of things to do. Like, you know, I have my list constantly. I'm so happy I just finally finished the last thing to do from 1987. I just moved into 1988. As soon as I pick up that radio in Dumont, New Jersey. Um, <laughs> oh boy, the bastards had it for about four months. Um, so, so what I do is, is to create an actual depression room. Now, now, we have places in our home to read, to sleep, to eat, to take in the mail, but for a truly contemporary life, it is necessary to facilitate our moods. It is, to, it is time to serve the needs of depression. Decorating should reflect and facilitate our lows as well as our highs, and I think it's best to just swallow it in. So, um, what I do, first of all, is I get a bed, and I go underneath it, and I wallpaper and decoupage underneath the bed, and I just bring in all the things that I love. Uh, my KitchenAid blender, my Cuisinart, my vacuum cleaner, all of my things, and I just, I sit in there, and there's nothing quite like lying under the bed with our prized possessions. And what I also do, if, you know, if I, is that I have a room, next slide, please, which I just paint totally black. That's what I do. It's a black room, a depression room. Why try to avoid it? Decorate with it. Decorate with the mood. And then I have chalk in there that you can write when you feel better, to-do lists. Just write on the to-do list. That always makes me feel better to try to think of things, too. So that's what I suggest for this February is to, uh, you know, is to have a depression room. Next slide, please. Next slide. Um, now, March... When moving into March is, is March, in, when I give a divorce party and I have the month of choice, I prefer March. Because um, it's the rain, the mud, you know, the cloudy days, the nimble crocus being destroyed by the weight of the snow that gives a March divorce some distinction. Now, like June is for weddings, like I said, March is perfect for divorce. Now. What I like to do in giving the party is that, um, you know, after the, the, the winter of, a ba of, you know, the couple battling it together, it's really good to get a little uh, divorce part going. Now, it's, I think what's missing from a good divorce party is a good ritual, and it is essential that the divorcing couple takes vows, and that is just one of the functions the divorce party provides. Now, I don't mean renew their wedding vows. I'm talking about taking new divorce vows. Example, some of the more common vows are, I promise to call you 12 times a day. I promise to go out with my ex-wife's girlfriend. I promise to go out with my ex-husband's boss. Now, I also believe in having maids of dishonor, worse man, present at the divorce party. Be creative. The ritual of giving back gifts is one of my favorites. And, he, and here the ex-couple give back all the stupid gifts they received, except for money. And um, 
Now, as for the setting, I always like to have the divorce party right where the unhappy couple lived, get right in their house in the misery. And it's more personal. For food, I just say, just order the pizza because no one's going to stay. It's only really about like a 20-minute event. Um, and there's so you just want to get everyone in quickly as possible, get the vows said, get everything going, and then what you want to do is to get the get the friends divided. See, that's what the service is, is for the the couple to know who's not going to be your friend anymore. And that's really what it's to do. Okay, they're there. I I can get on with my life. <laughs> that's it. Um, and you know you can give and and so and also and I have a nice book from this marriage is over where I have lots of good ideas that can be done in food and different things and uh, what to do with the wedding dress and all different kind of things. Um, next slide, please. Next slide. Yes, um, for April. Okay, April's Fools is an underused an underexpressed holiday. In my neighborhood, I plan to do something about it, and I start off the day with mooning. I ring my neighbor's doorbells and then flash them with my derriere that is some catchy phrase written on it like butt of jokes or moon rivers. Now, I like to make April Fool's prank special, even for the teenagers, and instead of letting them out of the house with any old toilet paper to make streamers in the neighbor's trees down the street, I hand paint and tie dye the rolls to give it a special Woodstock hippie Grateful Dead look. I also stencil paint their eggs before, well, before they go out egging. Now this causes a jealous rage in some parents. Well, I think it's jealous rage. Now I also love to make prank phone calls. Now here are some ideas for prank phone calls to be made to your favorite gourmet store. Is your brie running? You better go catch it. This is Popeye. I hear you've been using olive oil. How sour is your sourdough bread? Well, you better go sweeten it up. And may I speak with basil not so fresh? Uh, next slide, please. Now, on April, I have, on April Fools, last April Fools, I had my very own press conference. And I have called upon you today, and this is, this is from my press conference that I gave, I'll read you the speech. I have called upon you today, all editors and writers for women's magazines, and to members of the press who have been interested in my pursuit of domesticity to make a very important announcement. I've been doing a lot of soul search, and I've come to the conclusion that my entire career as a domestic artist has been a sham. I've come to realize that my lifetime work devoted to taking control of the creative power in the home has set back women 100 years. I have exploited the fact that the only acceptable power a woman can have without ostracism is in the home, and I profited from this sexism. I knowingly knew that since women can't be truly recognized or appreciated as equal partners in the arts, law, business, politics, religion, or sports, I gave the woman an acceptable, hyper-female, unattainable, domestic challenge to channel her energy. This pre occupation is gross and perverse. And from now on, I am going to direct my energies towards women's equality. I am starting a magazine called Phenomenal Women, where I promise where there will be no mention of diets, anything low fat, or getting rid of cellulite. No liposuction, no decorating, no arranging, no makeovers. I vow, in pro protest of this restraint, never to bake or frost another cake, and never to design or construct an appetizer tray in the shape of the Statue of Liberty. In addition, I will never participate in another project or magazine whose purpose is to have a woman be a better mother, wife, daughter, homemaker, and citizen. Instead, I will now, and from forever on, shall put my entire energy and life into a new magazine, and no matter how much it costs, it will be called Good fathers and husbands, a guide for men to get the house done, be sexy for their wives, and always cheerful for their family. In closing, with great regret and remorse, I vow never to arrange, prune, or cultivate a hydrangea. <laughs> what? Me? Never do anything with a hydrangea? Are you kidding? April fools.
Next. <laughs> um, now, okay, yeah, I, I have a videotape of this, which I didn't bring, sadly, um, where I was just so, I don't know, I was so influenced by the famous Jackson Pollock painting where he's splattering everything. One day, when I was nursing, I said, there's artwork in this, in this lactation here. So I did a series of nursing paintings on black velvet. And what you will need for your own nursing painting is first pieces of black velvet in the various sizes you want your painting, and then the ability to lactate. Um, now spread out the black velvet on a table, get comfortable, and then squeeze breast so milk squirts out on velvet. Now make abstract designs. Don't get, this isn't something that you're gonna get, you know, real anal about. Um, you've gotta give a little, let go a little bit. Okay, now when framing, do not mat. Let the velvet float without the glass touching the painting. All right, and this is a wonderful Mother's Day gift too, do you know, to give to your own mother or, you know, it just, it's, I have it just right in my house when you walk in. All right, next, next uh, slide. Now, People Magazine, when they gave me my reviews, they thought this was very grotesque. So I thought I'd take the opportunity to share my, my uh, idea for a hair bath mat for Mother's Day. Um, all right. The first thing is, is I was thinking, what am I going to give my mother? I know all of you are worried about that now. What are you going to give your mom for Mother's Day? Well, this is the time to start thinking about it. Um, okay, shower and wash hair, shave pits, shave legs for, there's hair in that drain. And also for you guys, you know, from your hair and the top of your head. Okay, there's hair in that drain. <laughs> also from washing your hair, there's hair in that drain. Five. There is an idea there. I've got to do something with it because any domestic artist knows that everything, you know, that isn't garbage in that, uh, in that trash bin. There's cosmetics in there. Anything can be made into something. Okay, collect the hair and have siblings save and mail their hair too. And don't have them cheat. You want to have a hair bath mat that's made from all the members of the family. Um, Seven, then you glue hair to jump ropes and extension cords and braid. Eight, or put hair and glue in pasta maker. No angel hair, please. Okay, next slide, please. Nine, braid hair pasta. Ten, you did it. You made a hair bath mat. Just, you know, make a nice coil. Eleven, with extra hair, make coasters. And, in, and give to mom for Mother's Day. Now, this is the one thing, because they're going to say, oh, I hope it's a big box of chocolates or an azalea. But, you know, they, they get used to it. Because um, they love you. Open, uh, next slide, please. Now, once your mother steps on her hair bath mat, she'll slowly forget her wanting of a big bottle of perfume or taken out to dinner for Mother's Day. Next slide, please. Watch out for spills when they find out the coaster is made out of human hair. Um, I've, got a I've got a few more minutes here, so I'd like to, the coaster's made out of what, yeah. Um, let's move on to uh, June. Now, okay, everyone's thinking, what are you gonna be doing for dads you know, you can't, you've got to keep dad in there. And so what I did is I just go to the grocery store and get every type of bread there is. And then every type of barbecue sauce. I start with a layer of rosemary focaccia. This is for Father's Day. Uh, rosemary focaccia, and then I put smoky barbecue sauce. Bagels, then chunky salsa barbecue sauce. Seven grain bread, red cayenne barbecue. They love this. They go absolutely crazy over this, dad. You won't believe the look on their face. It's unbelievable. Um, 
They just love it. Okay, pumpernickel cilantro bread and mustard chutney, or, you know, barbecue sauce, individual sponge cake, sourdough rye, and then lady fingers. Now you think, uh, you know, maybe put like, you know, gets like big chocolate chip cookies if you have to, but I like the lady fingers. And they love it. And you just, you know, you just scoop it. I try to uh, slice it, pass it out for Father's Day. It's incredible. Now, at the Father's Day, you have to get a good theme for the party. And um, the theme is, you know, there's no better theme on Father's Day than to really celebrate the phallus. And, um, <laughs> And you know, the, the phallus can be a colorful and complicated subject for the dad day, but uh, that then gives me a nice excuse to make sausage. Um, and you know, now with Lorena and John Wayne Bobbitt, that's really been kind of exposed and really kind of liberated, so that really like the talk of the phallus, it's really no big deal. I mean, it's in double day, it's, it's nothing now, okay? So any of you little squirmy, it's like, that's over with. I mean, there's something else now. The, 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 the penis is just like the ear now, okay? So, um, so once I start making sausage, uh, I can't stop. I, I go for days because I like to have all as many different types of sausage for the day of day for my father-in-law. I have my very own sausage workshop with specific sausage grinders, choppers, and casing stretchers. And I'm sure that they all can be fit under, um, the, uh, under the lower floor of any Manhattan um, apartment or just make your ceiling lower. You just keep all the equipment in there. Uh, and you know, I make the bratwurst, spockwurst, any, any smoky links, all just the right length, just the right thickness. Now, of course, the party's not considered a real success unless the table has a memorable centerpiece. Uh, could you please change the... Um, now, for my centerpiece, I call, uh, these I call the Bobbitt centerpiece. Um, and you know, every party, you know, it's not a party unless you have a centerpiece. Um, so. I carve, I get the Oscar Mayer hot dog, any kind of hot dogs is going to be a Frank, and you carve it. I carve the hot dogs into the shape of penises. Um, I have mine circumcised, you know, um, and I put them in old mason jars that I filled with water and food coloring. Now, this isn't a centerpiece that you're going to have to have, like, you know, you're bringing it out. Oh, kids, Dad's Day again, bring it out. No, this is something you just have and then, you know, kind of get rid of. So you don't have to think of it lasting forever. I haven't really tried to see how long this lasts. Um, I color it like I get lavender, I get pink, I get all different colors. And then I, you know, I put, I make more. I make a whole bunch of them. And I put in the mason jar the colored water. And then what I do is I close the lid, and what you want to do is you want to get the phallus at that point look like it's just there arbitrarily. <laughs> you don't want it to look rigid. You want it to look natural. And that's something that I've been practicing quite a while. And I, I've gotten it. Like you just, like always, you know what's good too? Odd numbers. That's what I found. Um, you know, hey, uh, you don't want them all just standing up. You know what I mean? It's like an evasive flower, something like that. Okay. Then you add the candle to the lid. Now, I love it. What is the beauty in this is when it starts dripping. It's great. And then I put a ribbon around it and bow, and I place it on the table. And this, you're not going to see anything like it when the conversation starts on this. <laughs> Because first of all, like they, they just start staring. And the best thing this is, yes, that's what it is. Um, <laughs> you know, I just meant, and that's really the best, best way. I mean, what did you expect? A tie with uh, some macaroni on it that spells crumb buns? I mean, uh, you know, this is the 90s. So I have that. Um, I'm just going to see if there's any other notes. Okay, yeah. So then when they say, um, it's, they're going, to say, what, they're going to say, what do you think are in those jars? That's what I always ask. When they ask, well, what are in those jars? I say, what do you think are in those jars? Just like, that's what I always say. And the one thing that everyone will agree on is that you'll never see these for sale in the Eddie Bauer catalog. <laughs> well, maybe my catalog. <laughs> Thank you very much. So
So uh, that was from my book, Living It Up. And um, I'm going to answer some questions, then I'll sign some books. And if anyone has anything they'd like to ask me, um, feel free to ask. Anything? Yes, sir. Yes. Well, the significance actually was something that uh, wasn't humorous. It really, what it came about was, um, everyone probably remembers the situation with Tawana Brawley, um, where she was found, found with a hefty trash bag with feces smeared on her, and then to remember the whole debate that some people were saying that she actually did it. Um, some people were saying that the drug dealers and all these things that happened with it. Well, I got very upset because I felt, first of all, she was 16 years old, and I felt that if she had actually done that, smeared the feces on her, how horrible that was. Like, I was just thinking at that moment that this was her better choice, that she was thinking this, this is a better choice for her than something else. And I thought it was, it was so horrible that that never kind of got up. No one ever looked at 16 years old that I, I felt that I couldn't, um, like, if I went up there and I couldn't go and smear, you know, feces on myself. So I used actually chocolate as a way of really this degrading thing and thinking about like, uh, chocolate, like bulimia, just the whole, and also it does look, you know, like that. And then I did monologues which were about oppression and about um, women being abused and just feeling um, with it. But that was the particular piece that then what has been singled out and what I have my lawsuit for. And so it's been totally taken out of context of what the, the piece is about. Um, anything, any other question? Yes. Well, I a hard time finding a place to perform in New York. And I really think a lot of it has to do with I can perform. Um, I go all over the world, uh, and uh, I do go on the West Coast. But I'm finding, and I really think that this has a lot to do with what's been happening with the NEA. I think that there's a fear, even though I do have a very l large audience, um, that I think there's a fear that comes from that I can affect their funding. And I can see that in terms of with my uh, career, that certain places I would be at, I haven't really been, that ha it hasn't been accessible to me in this town. And that, you know, it's something that through, I, I've been trying to figure it out. Yeah. Correct. Thank you. No, I have not. I performed at Alice Tully Hall three times, but I have not been asked. I've tried to. Um, I've not. My last performance that I had when I, I tried, I could not get a I got it to workshop. I could not find any place to produce the work. I did receive a Guggenheim um, for it. But um, it's, it's, uh, I think that this new piece that I have is actually, mu it's, it has humor in it, like in this, so I think it's more powerful. It's not just like, I would say just anger, because I can think that that's something that you could look at in terms of the idea, academically, that when a woman a pre uh, shows her feeling, like let's say Hillary Clinton, that the culture has a difficulty with an opinionated woman. So I've purposely, in this piece, have their strong parts in it, but I have a lot of humor in it. And so I was, I would be really eager to show the piece because I think that there's a maturity of kind of going through these certain situations. So I don't, I don't know. I'm going to be touring the West Coast. Um, if anyone has any ideas, I'm always, you know, ready. I don't know what it is. Sometimes I don't know if it's, you know, that's just how it is. I'm having difficulty. It doesn't seem to be easy right now. Yes. Oh, right. Oh, yeah, I did perform. You know, at the nightclubs, I am 40 now. And so it was great. It was being at a club, but it's a different experience. I, I have to say, I like, I feel that my work, I don't want to have necessarily the alcohol 
or the situation. I'd like to do, uh, I feel that my work, I would like to, ha I like having the work where people sit down and that they can take a shower for it. And then afterwards, it's not two, it's not three o'clock in the morning and they can think about it. I mean, I love that process. That's why I love the live event. And I think that the live event, I think also New York, this is, I travel all over the world and this is really the city that people look for. And I don't, uh, you know, so I have to kind of figure out how I'm going to do it if I, what, you know, and so I have this book now that's been one way I've been looking at it. It has a humor. It doesn't have uh, the weight of the sorrow, though. The, that's the weight of someone's sorrow. That now is just for dance. They see they're kind of taking out performance. It's 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 an it's a really fascinating time. You look at it. Is that we're at a time right now that you think like with the NEA, it, there's a chilling effect happening all over this country. And I go there, all these little places, and it's affecting libraries and all you know in so many different ways. First of all, the arts, the people that are administrating the arts, they're depressed. They're losing their jobs. How much how much can you go after attack after attack? And places where I've performed, I'm going to tell you, it's like they've gotten audited. You know, they get, you know, they've got uh, Helms is after them all the time, the Christian coalition. You know, people have limits. I can't, people have certain limits. They have to make choices. And I just feel sad because New York, I mean, when you want to go and grow corn, you don't come to New York. You know, you go maybe to Illinois, okay? You want to go, uh, uh, you know, and this is really the city for theater. And so I think something's going to happen. I hope my lawsuit, I won my lawsuit, the appeal. But, and I, and I did do an op-ed, but you know what I'm, I'm sad about? I'm, well, one is, is that self-censorship is happening for the young people in our culture. And that's something that we've got to do something about. I go to, I go, I get asked, one of the things I get asked for is I get asked to go to colleges all over this country to try to motivate people, to inspire them to do new work. This is something that is happening. I go there, the teachers take me, they sit me down, they'll sit in a car, any place, they'll say, this is happening. And I, I you know, I want to name the places or whatever, but they'll sit down, they say, we cannot, people come up to me, the students are saying, they're afraid to have controversy because they see what's happening out there. It's like during, you know, the 80s with uh, making money. This is what's happening now. So I have a real concern about that. But I think that, unfortunately, my case will probably be appealed. And so we've got, you know, there's more work to do. My lawsuit is that this piece that I was talking about with the cho uh, chocolate is that I received a grant, okay, for a couple of thousand dollars to do a new work. And what happened is that um, they took the grant away because they considered the work that there is indecent obscenity, or it was indecent. The piece I was talking about with Tawana Brawley. Therefore, I and three other artists sued the government because that they were using different decisions for giving out federal money, not like artistic. They were. Uh, um, you know, that they were using vague decisions on giving out federal funding, and that can, uh, so we did win. Uh, meaning that when the government gives out money, they can't restrict speech. They cannot restrict what you're going to say. Now, the government, they really want to say, and it has more than just like saying, okay, me, I'm like a performance artist. It goes a lot further than that. It can affect libraries, schools. It can affect... Um, freedom of religion, it can affect abortion. It, there's a lot weighing on this, which I wasn't aware of. And so that's what uh, the lawsuit is about. Yes? Um. Well, it's, no, I feel like with it, I've gotten threats on my life, different things. You can't, What happened is, is that I don't think that I have the nervous system that I had. Um, you know, I think it's, it's, it erodes on you. And I am a person, that is, I have an incredible family system. You know, I didn't do these choices, the work like looking, oh, I'm going to 
be, you know, deviate. I mean, I come from a very classical background where, uh, so that's what's been difficult is, is that. It, it grates on you over and over again. And that's something that I think that's important is to look at what happens now in being in a, you know, let's say di a little bit different artist. Or, and that's important. Lectures like this, lectures that go on the 9th Street, 2nd Street Y, are important. And in it's very difficult because in mainstream America, everything is based on like the sitcom and popular culture. Well, alternative culture eventually affects mainstream culture and gets in there. It does. I, I mean, I was a character on Seinfeld. I saw, I mean, you get in there. I mean, things get in there. But I love alternative culture. I don't want everything having to be 30 minutes. You know, I mean, I don't want everything to be McDonald's. I don't want everything to be like the Gap in Kmart. And a lot of that, what that has to do with, then goes into things with the differences in culture. It has to do with then sexual orientation, it goes to, and, you know, religion and, uh, and sexism. I mean, there's, everyone has to be the same. And I think that's what, uh, you know, concerns me very much, you know, about that we don't want to have that. Um, so that's what I feel. And also, you know, like the federal funding, they could then say with this, like, oh, there could be prayer in school. Do you know what I mean? They could, there are a lot of things that can kind of go in this stuff, which, you know, I'm against that. Um, anything else here? Okay. Oh, yeah, you went to, yes. Well, you know, I can't have any of my work on video because, like, Donald Wildman, the far right, actually goes looking for this, and then it's used against the artists. And I just can't take any more cases. So I've had it, like Lincoln Center. I've got the still letter. My, oh, we'd like to have a library. We want to have all of your work in the library. I can't. Till this case, they go, they're, it, I mean, I don't want to make it look like, oh, yeah, with it. It really does exist. They go, they're looking, they ha they're they much looking for like some, like a, there'll be a dancer zipping up their pants and they'll just use that. I mean, it can get so ridiculous where you're looking for the obscenity. It gets totally crazy. You know what I mean? Yes, sir. Yeah, I think it would, well, actually, I've been talking here at the Y, I think that it's got, I really think at a certain point, like, there's got to be some debate now of what, you know, what kind to be doing. Um, I th yeah, so that is something. I have been considering it and trying to figure it out and, and looking at it and looking at, you know, like, I was thinking, you know, I'm just talking a little bit, I, you know, I met with some people once, the Hollywood 10, it was. And, you know, their lives were, re I mean, we're talking about really ruined. You know, these things happen and people, you know, there are people like Joseph Papp, you know, he said, you know, he really was out of uh, CBS because of like communist, um, I'm getting hot up here, um, communist kind of threats and looking at, and I mean, these things really do kind of happen. And the scapegoats and looking for stuff happens and we just don't want to get it any, you know, worse than it is. Well, thank you so much. I think going from domestic to uh, the arts has been very, very good. Thank you. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.